Good morning. <clears throat> if you would please be finding your seats. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Chris Epler, uh, a preacher in the uh, in um, Texas. I almost said Tennessee. That's where you were before. He's, he's preached in Texas and Tennessee. Uh, he's done graduate work at Amridge in New Testament specifically, uh, completing a master's degree there, currently working on uh, a Ph.D. at Amridge. Uh, has been preaching for quite a while now. I won't try to add up all the numbers, uh, but he and his wife, Molly, are working with uh, a congregation in Orange, Texas um, at the moment. He was a student at Florida College way back around the turn of the millennium, so you can figure out how old that makes him. Um, I presume it was 2000, not 19, uh, or yeah, um, 19, that's the century even. So anyway, um, Chris is going to be speaking to us here about two unchangeable things. I bid you give him your careful attention. It was about 15 years ago, I was uh, sitting at my sister-in-law's dinner table, and we were having a discussion about the Bible, as we did often, and she asked me about a difficult passage she was wrestling with, and I'd just been preaching for a couple years, and uh, I said, well, I, I'm really not sure about that passage, and thought about it a lot over the years, and never did exactly come to a very solid conclusion about it. And with uh, great confidence you can have in me this morning, that is precisely the passage I'm talking to you about today. <laughs> I had to laugh when uh, they sent me my assignment and I, I, uh, I told my sister-in-law, I said, well, all I can say is that by this time next year, I will have a position on the matter. So, <laughs> the two unchangeable things. Folks, the steadfast anchor for a people adrift in a world of tumult. We emphatically and we proudly sing the words, Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? You know, Paul exclaims in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, we can be proud of the hope and the assurance that we have in Christ Jesus, our anchor. Ship anchors are peculiar things. They are intended to keep a ship in place or maybe just reduce its speed. However, the enormous forces of the sea that anchors uh, encounter that they cannot always hold against those things. And as I've thought about anchors over time, I realized that while I always thought they were something you placed and things stayed put, that's not the way it always works. In October 27th of 2020, the MV Dying Topaz sank after hitting a barge due to its anchor cable snapping. Two lost their lives in that. Of course, you don't have to go beyond Scripture to see similar things. We can turn to the book of Acts in chapter 27 where we read about the shipwreck of the Apostle Paul. And as they are going along, the Scripture tells us that they had thrown out the anchors and all the anchors were doing was helping slow them down a bit. But after a while, they became more of a detriment than a help and they had to cut them loose. Throw all the tackle overboard, ultimately throw all the cargo overboard. Everything was lost because the anchors could not withstand the forces of the sea. The two unchangeable things that we are going to discuss today, we're going to get there in a little bit, but it's going to be a bit of a journey if you will travel along with me. As we think about these anchors, I realize that I'm not here to tell you about an anchor of this sort this morning. 
I'm here to talk to you about an anchor that regardless of the size of the ship, regardless of the size and the fury of the sea, regardless of the amount of time that it must be depended on, it will not be moved. And the Hebrew writer tells us over in chapter 6, hopefully you're already there, I may be the only one that's not there actually. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19 The writer says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He likens our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to an anchor, an anchor that cannot be moved. This anchor is an anchor that transcends this physical world. It enters within the veil and it is held, it is Jesus himself. We are anchored, folks, to the life to come. Do you realize that? We live in a world of tumult. We live in a world where we're being tossed about here and there and the forces of this world are are crashing against us, but we are anchored, we are tethered to Christ within the veil. Outside of this world. A place that cannot be affected by the torrents of the life that we live in. Christ, the true anchor, and whom is the only hope. My friends, it does not escape my notice that I stand on this stage this morning on the shoulders of giants. When I think about all of the great men that have stood here and spoken to so many good people over the years... I wonder, how am I worthy to be here? Just a little country boy from southeast Texas. But I take comfort in this. I take comfort in knowing that those great men who have stood and who continue to stand on this stage in the past and through today, they feel just as I do today. How am I worthy to be here serving God's good people? in any capacity. And you know the answer to that question? The answer is, is I'm not worthy. And they weren't worthy. We are only to say, after we have done all the things which we are commanded, we are unworthy slaves, and we have done only what we ought to have done. You know, all of us preachers regularly say that the theme of the book of Hebrews is the word better. That's the key word. And there's a lot of truth in that. However, I think what we are seeing as we go through these studies this week, that the real key word in the letter to the Hebrews is Jesus. He is the anchor that enters within the veil. He is the anchor that will not be torn away regardless of the storm. He is the anchor in whom our faith is secure. We are unworthy before Him. But He cares for us and anchors and holds us. As we looked at in the last hour, the Hebrew letter has given a rebuke to those saints. If they did not cling to Christ and grow in the faith, He says that they were going to yield only thorns and thistles rather than fruit and that they would be, as verse 8 says, worthless and close to being cursed and end up being burned. It's hard to think of something more frightening than the Hebrew writer sending you a letter telling you that on your present course you are going to yield thorns and thistles and you are close to being burned. But lest they have no hope, as is the section of Scripture which I get to present to you during this Uh, I want to say hour, 45 minutes has been made clear. (laughs) But beloved, he says, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. He says, I'm telling you some difficult things, but we are convinced of better things concerning you. We are convinced that you are going to do, do differently. We are convinced that you are going to right the ship. The writer is sure they will do differently once admonished. Folks, sometimes we need to hear the difficult in order to do the wonderful. 
And if they're going to be different, if they're going to change course, they've got to hear some hard things from the writer. I know we live in a time where people don't want to hear hard things. People don't want that uh, unpleasantness in their mind or in their life. But friends, we must hear those things if we're going to be what Christ would have us to be. But what is their way back? What were they lacking? In a word, diligence. Diligence. So let's think a little bit about diligently realizing the full assurance of hope. The writer explains to them here in verse 9, Beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. He says, I'm talking to you about matters of salvation. I'm talking to you about matters of life or death, in other words, we might say in our modern idiom. Life or death, these are not small things, these are not insignificant things. I'm talking to you about matters of salvation. And so as we read along here, we, we want to know more about that, right? I want to be saved. They want to be saved. We all want to be right in the sight of the Lord. We all want life. We do not want death. How, is they, how are they going to go about this? Well, the writer explains to them that their faithful commitment to the Lord and clinging in hope to the true anchor was a matter of life or death, as it is for us. They had diligently worked to help others. He explains that. He says in verse 10, For God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward His name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. They were doing a lot of good things. They were ministering to one another. They were helping one another. But friends, it was not enough. It was not all that they needed to be doing. It was not all that was required of them. They needed to apply that same diligence in obtaining the hope and imitating promise inheritors. God is not unjust, the writer declares. He had not forgotten what they had done. He was not overlooking what they were still doing. If they would but correct course and return to their former diligence and trust in Him once more, all would be well. McClister writes, This in no way implies that their efforts of service to others merited or earned them anything before God, much less that the author here thought so. That's certainly the case. And while that is the case, we must also understand their diligence, it did demonstrate their faith and their love in Christ and for their fellows. It wasn't a matter of trying to earn their way, but rather it was a demonstration of the faith that they had. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20 is a statement of assurance. Store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break, up, uh, break in and steal. That is a message of assurance. If we will put our trust there, if we will put our treasure there, it will be waiting for us. Paul makes another bold statement of assurance in 2 Timothy 1 and 12. I am not ashamed, he says, for I know in whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. The assurance, my friends, is true. Make no mistake, we can say, we have salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can say we have an anchor that will not be affected by this world and as long as I cling to it, I will be His. We can say that with full assurance and a smile on our face. Yet, make no mistake, while God would remember and accept them once they were back on course, should they not do so, there would no doubt be eternal consequences. They must show diligence, he says in 6 and 11, so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Kind of similar to Revelation 2. Be faithful unto death and you will receive the crown of life. Diligence in the Bedag lexicon is defined as earnest commitment in discharge of an obligation or experience of a relationship. Friends, we are in a relationship. We are in covenant with Him. The saint must be earnest in that obligation. That is the meaning there of that word that is translated diligence. The implication, as Brother Greer was talking about earlier, is that we not be lazy. He says something similar right here in this passage again. Because the lazy will not inherit the promises. Only the diligent will do so. 
The saint must not be sluggish, the New American Standard says. I like N.T. Wright's translation as he gives it in the King's English. You mustn't be lazy, he says. The implication is that the lazy will not inherit the promises. Brother McClister puts it eloquently. The full assurance of hope comes not when one has done good things only in the past, but by serving faithfully until the end. Diligently realizing the full assurance of hope. So here's where we go on our journey. Hebrews 6 and 12 encourages them in this way, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. But he doesn't leave any doubt about who he's talking about. It is the man who is synonymous with the word promise, and that is Abraham. He's talking here about Abraham. He goes on, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. And so he's going to begin speaking to us about Abraham. And in order to realize what all he is talking about here, we're going to have to go back to Genesis. We've seen that as a theme this week, haven't we? We spent a good deal of time Monday night and yesterday in Genesis, and there is good reason. I heard Jeff Wilson say recently that the early chapters of Genesis are the operating system for the rest of the Bible. Now there's some of you people here from Kleinwood, don't go tell Jeff that I was in here quoting him because he fusses at me for doing that. But he needs to not be so quotable. The types and shadows that have been identified this week from the letter make this abundantly clear. The promises made to Abraham, my friends, are found in chapters 12 of Genesis, 15, 17, and 22. And if you'll turn there with me, or pick up your screen and tap on it, whatever you're doing, we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 12 here for just a little bit. Genesis 12 is when Abraham is first called. You might leave your marker if you've got one here in Hebrews 6, like I'm going to do right now, because we're going to be back over there directly. Genesis chapter 12, we have the writer here, explaining to us, giving us, stating for us the call of Abraham. And it begins in this way, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the, ones who, uh, the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so here in Genesis 12, we have the calling of Abraham. We don't know much about Abraham prior to this. We don't have much information. The preceding verses at the end of the preceding chapter tell us that he was there with his father and they had traveled as far as Haran. And it is here where he is called. But beyond that, we don't know. Abraham leaves the family from Haran and he goes on to the land that the Lord was going to show him. It is here that Abraham is called. There is clearly some recognition of Yahweh in Abraham. He is told to get up and go. And what did he do? He got up and went, right? Just as the Lord told him to, just as matter-of-factly as that, the text states it. The faith required of a man who is 75 years old, who's just been given the promise of being made a great nation and has a barren wife to just get up and go. It just can't be overstated. It's tremendous. It's unbelievable. But that's what he does. However, I want to say this as we start looking at Abraham for a little bit, it is easy to look at men like Abraham and just think that these men always had it figured out. Oh, that's Abraham just just being Abraham. He's just a super human. He's just a super God follower. And that's why Abraham does what he does. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think that as we look at Abraham, we see a growth process in this man's faith. I think that as we look at Abraham, we're going to see a whole lot more of ourselves than maybe we tend to think. And so here in Genesis 12, we begin to see a 25-year-long process of faltering, questioning, growing, and ultimately completely trusting in the Almighty His faith, in other words, was a process to reach maturity the same as is the case for every other person that walks on this planet and chooses to name the name of the Almighty. 
So let's look over in Genesis 15. We see this initial step of faith. Well, in Genesis 15, you know, in the meantime, some things happen. Abram and Lot, a war with the chieftains, the kings, depending on your translation there. But here in chapter 15, Abram is once more promised a son. These promises are made again. After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Now that doesn't sound like a man who completely understands and trusts necessarily in the plan. He believes in God. He's a follower of God, but he's got some questions. I don't have a child. How is this going to be? The only one that I have is Eliezer of Damascus in my household, and he is appointed to be the heir of all. Is that what you're talking about, Lord? You're going to bless me through Eliezer? Is that what we're doing here? And I think it's interesting the way Abram speaks to God. It's similar as we were talking about yesterday, how Moses spoke to God. The relationship was special. Why, God? How can this be, God? He wants to know. One might be tempted to think that his trust is here completely secure, right? Because after all, this is one of those occasions, like in verse 6, that says, Then he believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And you say, oh, there's Abram. He's got it all figured out. It's been reckoned to him as righteousness. But the NET notes, I think, are helpful here. The text speaks of the specific way that this word is, that is believe. And it says, while in Hifel, the form used here, it means to consider or treat something as reliable or dependable. And so I think that's where we're at with Abraham. He sees the reliable nature of God. He sees the dependable nature of God, but he's still a man with questions. He's still a man who's trying to figure out how this can possibly be. He has his doubts. Abraham believes in the reliability of God, but he has a way to go to see the plan. But I see this. His faith has taken another great leap. God says it's not going to happen through Eliezer. And he doesn't throw up his hands and walk away. He believes God, and it's reckoned as righteousness. There's a long journey ahead because in chapter 16, the very next chapter, right after it is said he believed God and it was reckoned him as righteous, guess what he does? His wife says to him, let me give you my maid, Hagar, as a concubine, and you go into her and raise up children. We're going to make God's plan happen, in other words. And Abraham says, okay. And that moment of whatever you want to call it, doubt or whatever, led to a thorn in the side of the people for all of their history because of the child Ishmael that was brought up through Hagar. This mistake was going to bring about a people that would be problematic for the children of Israel for all of their days. And so that happens here in chapter 16, right after we learn about Abraham believing God and it being reckoned to him as righteousness. Well, we go to chapter 17, and once again, the promises are reiterated. Abraham, in this chapter, is called to be circumcised. Now, when Abram was 99 years old... Yahweh appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout your generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Spoken to a man, 99 years old, with a barren wife who had been waiting for 25 years. And to that man, the Lord says, 
you and all your household must be circumcised. I think that maybe that's lost on us sometimes. But let's just sum it up this way. His faith took another great leap forward that day, okay? Remember that at this point, Ishmael has been rejected, but Isaac has yet to come. The Lord is in those final preparation stages, changes His name and such. But Abraham entered into this level of commitment with the Lord, still with another years to go before the promise would be fully realized here in Isaac. And so then we get to the final place where the promises are made, and that is in chapter 22. Chapter 22 is a notorious passage. Many people today have a real problem with Genesis chapter 22. How could a loving God do this? Require this of Abraham? And it extends even beyond that. How could a loving God ultimately send His own Son as the antitype of these events? People ask today. But my friends, it is not what it is framed to be by those today. Rather, what we see is the end of a process in faith building and growing of Abraham. We see a man who is going to leave the events of Genesis 22 and he is not going to be the same person again. And I say that in a good way. Attesting to the great faith of this man and where it becomes. This chapter begins in parallel with chapter 12, if you notice. If you look at Genesis chapter 22, we already were back in Genesis chapter 12, and the Lord tells him, get up and go to the country that I am going to show you. Well, Genesis 22 begins in parallel, and honestly, I think that is on purpose. Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham, and he said, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Can you imagine? But God says to him, I want you to get up and go, just like he said in chapter 12. And just like happened in chapter 12, the next verse tells us he rose early in the morning and he got up and went. What faith. It's not like God said, I want you to go to the land of Moriah. I got something for you there. And then laid it on him when he got there. He said, I want you to go to Moriah and you're going to offer your son when you get there. Not only did he get up, he rose early in the morning and got up and went. That is the faith of this man. Can you imagine what's going through the head of Abraham as he walks along? thinking about what the Almighty has asked him to do, especially after he has waited 25 years, probably at least 30, 35 years have passed at this point. I waited all this time and now he wants me to do what? I can't imagine what was going through the mind of Abraham. Although we are given an inkling, because Hebrews chapter 11 tells us, that he considered God is even able to raise him from the dead. One way or another, what God has promised is going to be. And so he went to Moriah and did just as God told him to do. And I'll tell you this, I think sometimes we're inclined to say things like, you know, well, it was the time when, when Abraham, you know, he, he almost sacrificed his son, or, or God, God told him to sacrifice his son, and he got up and he went, but, but the Lord stopped it or whatever. Let me tell you this. I don't like that terminology. Here's what Abraham did. He went to that mountain and he sacrificed his son. That's what he did. Okay? Just as sure as anything, his son was dead. His hand was on the way down when God intervened in the way he intervened. Abraham sacrificed his son. Okay? And I don't think we have to soften that statement. That's what happened on that mountain. God sees the heart. God knew in that moment exactly where the heart of Abraham was was. This chapter begins in parallel with chapter 12. He got up and went, did what God told him to do, and in not withholding his son, which he had waited for 25 years, God finally confirms the promises that have been made, and he does so with an oath. Look with me at verse 16 of chapter 22. 
Then the angel of Yahweh came to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares Yahweh, because you have done this thing. Notice he didn't say almost did. You have done this thing. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Notice the bookends there. The Lord comes to him and he says, I've sworn this because you have done this thing. And he concludes it, you are blessed because you have obeyed my voice. The promise, the oath is bookended by the faithful obedience of Abraham. And it is interesting to note that God has made these three promises to Abraham and now he backs them up with an oath as though he needed to do that. He certainly did not, but he does so so that Abraham will be doubly assured. And it is interesting to note that from this point forward, when those promises are mentioned in the Abraham account, it is not God making them to Abraham. It is Abraham speaking them himself and defending them. Oh, servant, I want you to go to the land of my people and I want you to find a wife for my son Isaac. But don't bring anybody here from anywhere else. If you can't find a wife for her there, then you are free from obligation because Abraham was not going to take any chances with the promises God had made to him and interposed with an oath. It is this pivotal moment in Abraham's life at Moriah when his faith in God and the hope he has given to Abraham are fully actualized. Abraham didn't earn these promises, but by his faithful obedience, he demonstrated to God his worthiness to receive the gifts that God had promised to him. And that takes us to our text of the morning. You may be thinking, oh wow, this was just an introduction. How much time do we have in here? I'll be brief. Back in Hebrews chapter 6, we read about the unchangeable things relative to Abraham. Look with me here, beginning in verse 13. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of His purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. It may not be precisely clear in Hebrews 6 alone what these unchangeable things are, but when you take it and look at what happens in Genesis, especially in chapter 22, it becomes much clearer. And I think it's just simply this. God cannot lie. And based on this fact, He makes two levels of statement. He makes the promises that He made in 12, 15, 17, and reiterates in 22, and then He interposes them with an oath. He can't lie. His promise is unchangeable. His oath is unchangeable. And through these two statements, two commitments, however you want to word it, Abraham is doubly assured. So what? From our perspective. What does this mean for us? 
We need to see ourselves in the Abrahamic promises, folks. The Christian and the Abrahamic promises. Notice this. Notice at chapter 6 and verse 17 of Hebrews. In the same way God... He's been talking about Abraham, right? And doing so in the third person. But in the same way God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of His purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. You see the shift? He talks about Abraham, but then he comes back to the we. Just as Abraham was doubly assured, folks, so are we. So are we. McClister notes, the transition to the word we is significant. Believers in Christ are the true spiritual descendants of Abraham. And folks, that is we. That is us. The promises and the oath of God to Abraham were merely a beginning to a plan of redemption that would extend to all peoples and generations and span the remainder of time. And here we are today, the fortunate recipients of it. Abraham sacrificing Isaac was a type of what was to come in the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. The great faith of Abraham is expressed in Hebrews eleven nineteen, 19, like we said a moment ago, in that as he's walking along, he considers God's even able to raise him from the dead. And essentially, that is what God did. Just as Abraham did not withhold his son, so our father would not and did not withhold his son from us. However, as Golden Gay points out, this time there was no ram waiting in the thicket. There was no plan B. Jesus Christ was the only plan. God swore by Himself as there was no one higher. In parallel, Jesus had to die as God with us as there was no one higher to do the dark task. It could only be Him by which it could be done. The two unchangeable things give the modern saint, that is us, hope also. N.T. Wright says it this way, and I I like this, so I'm just going to give you the quote, it's a little lengthy, about the obedient faith that we are to have. He says, doing this isn't whistling in the dark. We don't have faith in faith, as people sometimes suggest. Christian hope isn't optimism, a vague sense that things will probably turn out all right. Christian faith is trusting and going on trusting through thick and thin in the God who made unbreakable promises and will certainly keep them. As we have seen, this is not to say that Abraham didn't struggle to maintain his trust, that he never faltered, that he never questioned But it is to say that he kept clinging to God at his anchor until he could see. The abiding faith of the saint is to be one that may not always understand, but trust in God to work all out for his glory and for the benefit of his people, you and me. And so going back then, the Hebrew writer concludes the section by bringing it full circle. He talked to them early on about the tumult of this life and and the troubles that they were encountering and the thorns and thistles that they were going to bring up if they kept being swayed by the things of this world, the things of this life. Well, he comes back around to all that type of language here at the end of it. And he says, We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil. We're back to storms and the turmoils of life. And I don't know about you, I think I do actually, because we're all the same pretty much. We live in a time of tumult. We live in a time where we don't know what's going to go on from one day to the next. But I would say this, I think to some degree everybody lives in a time of tumult. The world is the world. And the world's going to keep on worlding. We shouldn't expect different than that. But what we should realize as saints is that it doesn't matter. Because we have an anchor that enters within the veil. That we can cling to and try 
as hard as the world might, it's not going to dislodge that anchor. And it's not going to dislodge me. It is having a mind. This life is full of tumult, of turmoil, but the child of God has taken refuge in him. It is having a mind that God can and he will protect and will bring about his will. It is living knowing that based on his promises and his oath, we will realize the hope if we will but remain diligent in his way. You know, something obvious, and, and you know, I guess I just I mean, all you people are probably going to say, yeah, I mean, how did you not see this? But yeah, something that should have been rather obvious, finally occurred to me. You know, an anchor has to have a tether. And I guess when I think about Jesus entering within the veil, I've got this lofty idea as though He's up there doing something and, and there's just not this connection between Him and me. But friends, there is a tether. There is a cable to an anchor. And I think maybe that's some of what may be in the mind of Paul in places like Romans 10. But the righteousness, this is verse 6, but the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down? Or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth, and it is in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. He's not in heaven disconnected from us. Or down in some deep place so far that he's disconnected from us. He is near to our heart. Or maybe to use the Hebrews terminology, he is an anchor to which we are tethered. Far more, though, when we think about the tether, I think far more than us climbing some lifeline to him, if you'll pardon the southeast Texas, at some point he's going to reel us in. I should have grasped it a long time ago, really if from anything else, just from verse 2 of the song where we started. It is safely moored, twill the storm withstand, for tis well secured by the Savior's hand, and the cables passed from his heart to mine can defy that blast through strength divine. Sing with me. We have an anchor that keeps the soul Steadfast and sure while the billows roll Fastened to the rock which cannot move Grounded firm and deep in the Savior.